Hello again, and uh, uh, a quick note about Trustworthy ML Initiative. We are a group of people interested in this broad area of research in capacitating uh, trustworthy machine learning, and it will almost be a year for us running this seminar soon. Our initiative has multiple goals. Firstly, we want to make it easy for everyone to access fundamental resources. Our website has a curated list of such resources ranging from introductory to advanced. Well, well, we also want to provide a platform for early career researchers to showcase their work. And to uh, encourage discussion and debate, we have an active Twitter handle. So if you haven't already, please follow us today. And lastly, we will be organizing symposium and workshops in the near future to strengthen our community. Okay. And now back to today's agenda. Today's session is divided into two parts. The first hour is a talk and, mod, uh, and a moderated chat with the speaker. And the second one is a free flow participant discussion. The speaker will give the talk uh, until roughly 40 minutes later. And uh, if you have questions in this duration, please submit them in the Zoom QA too. And the questions will be answered periodically. If time permits, small technical questions will be answered at the end of the talk. And this will be followed by a fan chat with the speaker on the end of the talk. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> at 1 p.m., we take a five-minute break and um, continue at 1.05. Okay, now without further ado, we are honored to have us, Sarah Manila Kin today. And uh, she is an assistant professor in the Informatics Institute at University of Amsterdam and a research scientist at IBM, MIT IBM Watson AI Lab. She received her PhD at VU Amsterdam on logics for causal inference and assessing in 2017. And um, uh, now her current focus is on the causality inspired machine learning, applications of causal inference to machine learning, and especially transfer learning, and formally safe reinforcement learning. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Kokon. I will try to share my screen. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm very excited about being here. And so today I wanted to talk to you about causality inspired machine learning. And in practice, I want to talk about what can causality do for machine learning. And this is a very general topic. So we'll focus on a very specific case uh, as an example of you know, things that can be done. And I will talk about the domain adaptation case. And this is joint work with Thijs van Norman, Thomas Klassen, uh, Stefan Bongers, Philip Persek, and Joris Moy. Um, oops, sorry about that. Okay. So I think, um, here, uh, I may be preaching to the choir in trustworthy ML, but from my perspective, and you know, it's a very biased perspective as a causality researcher, uh, I think there are some ideas that you know, um, we can use from causality for machine learning. Especially, I think um, we can agree that you know, machine learning, especially trustworthy machine learning, needs to be able to deal with biased data. For example, it needs to be able to deal with data in which there are some fairness concerns, there is selection bias, uh, there is generalization, so there are generalization issues, or you want to generalize to something, um, a different domain. And if you, even if you have heterogeneous data, or you have small samples, or missing data, or not ID data, you would want to combine them somehow together. And in practice, a lot of the times, um, what people expect when they use machine learning is not just uh, correlation in a sense, but they do expect actionable insights. They want to know which decisions can they make um, based on the data. And so that's generally cannot be made only from correlations. And uh, we, I think uh, we can all agree that causal inference can help at least with some of these questions. And so there is actually quite some work on how to do systematic, systematic data fusion and how to reuse biased data and also not the ID data. And it's also a systematic way to extract actionable insights. And in this talk, I'm going to argue something slightly um, more relaxed. So I will argue that in general, uh, sometimes, um, or let's say sometimes full causality may be a bit too expensive or it's not necessary to know everything about the causal graph, but you can still use ideas from causality to help machine learning. And so this is what I will talk, I will call causality inspired machine learning. 
And here, as I said before, I will focus on the uns unsupervised domain adaptation as an example. But I'm, I'm sure this is a, something that I hope will kind of um, continue in also different areas of machine learning. Um, so let's see the difference or the similarities between transfer learning and causal inference. So let's say in transfer learning, I could have an example in which I'm trying to predict what happens when the distribution changes. So if I have a self-driving car and I train it in the US and I want to apply it in UK, I would need to understand that in UK people drive on the dif a different side of the road. And so there, there needs to be some kind of modification to my algorithm. And similarly, in causal inference, I'm interested in predicting what happens when I do an intervention. And there is really a lot of work on uh, what happens after a perfect intervention. So an intervention in which a variable becomes independent of its parents. And so that's, for example, that's called do calculus. And so it's been uh, described, for example, by in, in the causality book by Pearl in 2019, 2009. Um, here, instead, I'm going to focus on soft interventions. So they are slightly different, uh, slightly different semantics for interventions in which uh, the distribution of a variable given its parents changes, but the variable doesn't become independent of its parents. And so the idea is that uh, soft intervention can be possibly, you can see it as an arbitrary change of distribution. And so this connection between causality and transfer learning is not my idea, so it's not novel for me. So this is something that people have been pointing out for at least 10 years, almost, uh, from my symbol 2012. And um, I'm going to focus on, again, domain adaptation. And so first I, I'll give you like a bit of an idea of uh, some of the notation I'm going to use in the talk and give you an example. And then I'm going to explain um, how can causality help in this case. So let's assume we have one or multiple source domains. And so for each of the source domains, we have a set of covariates or features X and a label Y. And so from, from each of the, the data points, uh, the, some data points are distributed according to P of S uh, of X and Y. And we may have different P of S given on the different source domains that we may have. And then we have a target domain. And in the target domain, we also have features X and labels Y. But in this target domain, the distribution P of T of X and Y is different than the distribution we have in the source domain P of S. And so the question is, um, how can I, for example, predict Y in the target in a way that I can also use the information from the source domain, even if I know the distributions are different. And especially, I think um, this problem is very interesting in the case in which we don't have any label in the target domain. So we have only a set of features in the target domain, and so we have no labels, and we want to predict the labels of uh, these examples. So maybe to be a bit more uh, concrete, I'm going to talk about an example. Um, so let's assume we have um, like samples from mice and we have on the left, we have normal mice. So each row is a mouse and each column is a feature we're measuring. And we have a feature that we call Y, which is a special feature. It's the label that we're trying to predict from the features X1 and X2. And we have uh, complete data in this case. So this is our source domain. And in the other case, we have mice again, but these mice have been genetically modified. So we don't know exactly if the relationship between the features and the outcome, the variable that we're trying to predict, if they are the same or they're not. And by chance, we have this unsupervised domain adaptation case, so we don't have any of the variables Y for any of the genetically modified mice. So the question is, how can I somehow learn something from the normal mice and transfer it to the genetically modified mice? And so from a graphical perspective, um, we can see this domain adaptation problem from a graphical perspective. And it's useful because we're able to then reason on it, as I will explain a bit in, uh, in detail in the following slides. And so an idea is, OK, we can just have maybe a variable d. It's an indicator variable. It represents the domain. And now we can consider the data as coming all from a single distribution, p of x, y, and d. And then we can maybe have a um, causal graph that represents the relationships between the different variables. So this can be known, or in other cases, it can also be unknown. But we can still um, represent it with a possibly unknown causal graph. And the idea is that now, if we do either know the causal graph, or we have a set of condition independencies that allow us to find 
some idea about which are the possible causal graphs, we can then use this operation, uh, which is a graphical criterion, criteri criterion for um, discovering conditional independences in Bayesian networks. We can use this operation to reason about invariances across different domains and about robustness. And I think, um, so this is, let's say, the main point of the talk. Um, one of the contributions that causality has um, to robustness is a principal way to reason about invariances, which sometimes people may not consider, and then they may fall in some common pitfalls. And I will show you some examples of these common pitfalls. So now I will try to give you like a very, very quick uh, intro to this separation. But I really suggest that if you don't know it, if you don't know anything about this separation, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's better to look, for example, at this interactive demo. Uh, and there is the link in, on the slides. Or just you know, check the original papers. And I think it's a much better introduction than what I can give now in this very quick uh, talk, essentially. So the idea of this separation, so I'm going to try to explain to say at least the idea and why you should care. The idea of this separation is that it's a graphical criterion that if you do know the graph, you are able to read the conditional dependencies out of the graph under some standard conditions, which are these two ones, the causal macro assumption and causal faithfulness assumption, which are described in the graph. Both of these together, um, they mean that whatever we find with this separation, it will be also conditional independence. So now I will give you like the base case um, for this separation. And in this case, um, we say that we have two variables, X and Y, they are disconnected. If there exists a path, which is a sequence of edges that are distinct, between them that it's unblocked. And this is they're disseparated. Uh, sorry, disconnected if they're unblocked. Otherwise, it's disseparated. And in this case, when we're not conditioning on anything, unblocked just means there is no collider. And a collider is a variable in which there are two edges coming in. So for example, like this one. So in this case, in which we're not conditioning on any variable, we have that X is dependent of Y, so X is deconnected with Y, and we will see that in the data that's generated from this graph, X is dependent on Y. So this is, let's say, uh, the idea of the reading conditional dependencies in this case, or marginal dependencies in this case, from the graph. And on the right-hand side, instead, there is this path from X through Z, through Z to Y, and because this is a collider, this path is blocked, and so we say that these two variables, X and Y, are Disseparated. So there are also ways by uh, conditioning to block and unblock uh, essentially some paths. Um, so if you do have a chain, so you have X going through Z to Y, and you do observe Z, or you condition in it, then you're able to block the path from X to Y through Z. And in the other case, the collider has a, a kind of a weird situation in which there is a path from X through Z to Y, and usually this path is blocked, so X and Y are independent or disseparated. But uh, when we condition on Z or descendants of a collider, essentially we can open that path. And so this looks very theoretical. And I'm sure maybe this talk, like these few slides I gave you, they're not very good at explaining everything. But I really want to suggest you to try to learn about this operation because it's, as, you, as I will show you later, it's going to be very useful to kind of um, reason about possible invariances in transfer learning. And so the reason this is, is because this operation also works with context variables. So before I was introducing this uh, fake, essentially, D variable that was representing the domain. And in practice, you can use D also in this kind of uh, this separation statements. And the idea is that, you know, we can avoid calling this separation because we have this assumption. So we can talk only about independencies and dependencies. And the idea is that the conditional independencies with this D variable, they will tell us about invariance across domains. So if a variable Y is uh, independent of D given X1, then we know that the conditional distribution of Y given X1 doesn't change across the domains. So shall I maybe take a, a question or? Yeah. Oh, okay. The clarification question. Okay, I think that, that might be true I, I'm, I will need to check um, so I think maybe it depends on the slide so maybe the person who sent it can send let can tell me on which slide or more or less when it was I think maybe that's or you know there might be some kind of small mistake so let me know about that <laughs> 
uh, we can go back to it maybe later. So um, the idea is that despite possible errors on my side, uh, this separation allows us to reason about which features are invariant. Because um, if you do add these domain variables or context variables, you're able to essentially distinguish uh, which conditional distributions vary across the different domains or which, which do not. Let me see, maybe it's not a question. Ah, okay, I see. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so three slides back. I think maybe maybe there might be some. Uh, so, yeah. yeah? Uh, this one? Yes. Yeah. Okay, here. So, here is just an example. So, it's um, the, I think this is an example of um, a case in which you could have domain adaptation. And I will show you in this example a bit later, I will show you how dissipation can uh, help us choose which of the features is the, it's a transferable one and which one is a biased one. So this one should be correct. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear. Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes, yes, now it's much better. Yeah, sorry about that. What did you say? The edge going from Y to X2 is in fact correct is what you're saying. For now, yes. Uh, it's essentially by assumption. I will show you why is it. Uh, so if this is the case, why is it the problem that you choose X2? So correct. let me actually. Yeah, okay, let me just maybe go towards that direction. And then, okay, it's so actually, this is the slide that shows that. So in this case, this is the same graph is just written in a, it's just in a different, it's just reorganized in a different way. So that we have the on top. And so this is an example of unsupervised domain adaptation. And the idea is here you have D, the domain, and you have, it's just like zero when you have, I don't know, for example, the normal mice, and one when you have the genetically modified mice. So one, it's, it's only one in the target domain. And the idea is that we have, um, let's assume we do know this is how the data is generated for now. Uh, this is something we'll, um, we'll essentially don't need anymore later on, but for now, let's assume this is the case. Now, the question is, shall I use X1 to predict Y or shall I use X2 to predict Y? And I think I spoiled it before, so I already told you the answer, but maybe I can show you with a graph why that is the case. And so we define the separating features and other people have called them also stable features or invariant features. They're the sets of features that this separate the context variable D, so the green one, from uh, the dissipate the, the label Y from the context variable D. So is X1 or X2, either of them are, which of them are separating? So the idea is if I take only X1, let's assume I do plot Y on the Y axis and X1 on the X axis. And let's assume I observe the source data. So it's the green crosses. Um, so I can see that the distribution of the green crosses, I can learn a model on the green crosses. And let's say I learn a linear model just because it's the easiest thing to learn. And I can see that the line will work also for the target dots. So it's the, the target circles. And that makes sense because the essentially, um, because I know from the graph that Y and D, they will be disseparated if I condition X1. That's why you know dissipation is useful. And so this means that the essentially the conditional distribution of y given x1 will not change in the different domains. And this means I can only use uh, the data from the source to learn a model. And even if I never see the, the data from the target, I've never seen their labels because, for example, I'm in an unsupervised domain adaptation case, the data from the source will already be able to give me a model that transfers very well to the target if I use only x1. On the other hand, um, if I use X2, so here I'm plotting Y and X2, and I use the source data to learn a line. In the target data, the line is completely different. So the distribution of the, you know, uh, Y given X2, so the source data distribution is different from Y given X2 in the target. And this is not surprising if I do know the causal graph, the generated data, because I have this path from D to Y through X2, uh, when I condition X2, it's a collider. And also if I do uh, not condition X1, there is another path from D through X1 to Y that is open. So essentially this operation allows me to reason the, about the fact that um, I may want to use X1 as a predictor, uh, but I cannot even use X1 and X2 together because X2 is going to bias my prediction. So this is what this operation allows me to reason about. And so, as I said 
in, in conceptually in the unsupervised domain adaptation case. So here I did plot the, let's say the true values of Y in blue, but in the unsupervised domain adaptation case, I never have the label Y. So I could have like, if I use both X1 and X2 to predict Y, I train it on the source and I try to apply it to the target, I may get an arbitrary large error because I, I will never see actually any of the Ys in the target. So I'm not sure what will happen. So it's in a sense, very unsafe. Uh, does this make sense to you guys? So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. I think we are good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think we can also answer, I can also answer the questions later. And this is if this is confusing, let's say the summary of this slide is uh, this separation allows you to reason about which of the features are stable or transferable across different domains, even if you don't have any label in the type of domain. But in this case, we do assume that we know the graph. And so the um, I will. In, in our algorithm, we actually don't. And so that's why I'm going to explain a bit later. Let me just check. Okay. So another thing that I think I was hoping, you know, that um, would make maybe um, be interesting for this crowd is that uh, what kind of other things can this separation do and what kind of common pitfalls happen in transfer learning? So uh, one of the things that I observed uh, in some of the papers is that people assume that if something is invariant, um, across many different data sets, then it must be causal. And this is not true because separating uh, a separating feature set doesn't mean it's a causal set. So here I'm trying, so here is me trying to give you an example that is more practical. So let's see how this goes. So let's assume we have as a domain, uh, we have different data sets and the data sets come either from the general population or there is another data set and the data set comes from people um, who attend a culinary school. And let's assume this is the ground truth. Let's assume this is how the work works. It doesn't necessarily work like this, but let's assume for now it does. So let's assume that you know you have some cooking skills, and if your cooking skills are not as good, for example, like for me, then uh, you may order more takeaway. And the more takeaway you order, the more tips you have to pay per month. And so we have this causal graph of cooking skills causing takeaway, takeaway causing tips per month. And we have the culinary school is like um, it's just. And it's it just label to say that we have different domains, one in which we have a lot of culinary students, which ho hopefully have a, a better distribution of cooking skills, and watching one in which we have the general public, in which maybe the skills are a bit uh, less good. And so the idea is that um, if I want to predict how, many, how much money people spend in takeaway, and I want it to be independent of the different domains I have, so the general population and the very specific population in the school, um, I'm able to use both cooking skills and tips per month as uh, good predictors. Actually, obviously, tips per month is a very good predictor of how much somebody spends on takeaway, right? And so that makes sense. And they're both invariant. But uh, although it's a good predictor, it doesn't mean that tips per month, how much you spend in tips causes how much you spend on takeaway, but the opposite. So this is kind of, now it sounds kind of obvious. But in other cases, people do these kind of assumptions, for example, when they're training on images, and it's a bit less obvious. And so the idea is, and this is ob like at this point obvious, that if something is invariant across many different data set, um, it doesn't mean that this is a causal parent of the label you're trying to predict. So you need more assumptions. And there are some methods like invariant causal prediction from Peter Santal, which actually does deal with this kind of how to use invariances to find which are the causal parents. So another common misconception is that I will assume that if I have some source domains, I will just train on things that are you know, stable in my source domains across my different source domains. And then I just hope that this holds in any future target domain. And as you can imagine, this might not be the case because as I said before, um, you know, both tips per month and cooking skills are good predictors of how much somebody spends on a takeaway. But this is based, let's say on the US, for example. I'm now in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, people don't tip uh, a takeaway. So I think this may kind of bias the, the general um, idea. So you don't want to use tip, tips per month as a prediction because it will not be useful for you. It will bias your prediction. And so it's not very good against, so it's, not, it's, it's a very good predictor in the source domains, but it doesn't mean it's robust in, in domains in which you have distribution shift, for example, in a different country. Does this make sense? <laughs> 
and yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, at least to you it makes sense. So that's, I hope, good. And so uh, the last misconception that I think this separation can, and graphical models can help you to reason about in transfer learning is that parents are not generally the best choice to generalize. So in general, uh, if I do have uh, this causal graph, and I also assume that takeaway and tips per month are caused by income, uh, if I use income and takeaway to predict, now I'm predicting the tips per month, so that's the, the red variable. Um, if I use the causal parents, um, they will kind of, in a sense, pr protect me from, from a lot of distribution shifts, from a lot of uh, things that may change in the, in the data. But uh, if income is unobserved, so it's a latent variable, then it turns out that actually, um, if I want to predict how, many, how much money I spend in tips per month using how much money I spend in takeaway, it's not a good idea because it's confounded. So there is like a latent variable causing both. But if I use cooking skills, this is an unconfounded variable. So cooking skills will be able to reliably tell me um, how, based on my cooking skills, how much tips per month do I uh, spend or not. And so this is something that starts to get a bit less obvious. And so this separation and knowing the graph will, will essentially help you to find which of the which of the variables you should use. So the ones which are conditional, make, make the label conditionally dependent of the domain. And so in this case, cooking skills is a robust predictor, even if it's not a direct cause. So that's essentially the takeaway. Even if it's not a parent, sometimes the parent may be more biased um, than the, for example, ancestors or other variables. But this can only happen with latent variables. So if there are some latent confounders. So it depends on your case, you may want to, um, use parents or not, essentially. And so now I'm going to maybe, let me just stop for a QA. Mm. So in the domain of, so, okay. So there was a question asking if it's um, in the interest of domain generalization or adaptation, if invariant features, irrespective of its causal nature are useful, useful nevertheless, Yes or not? So it depends because if you have, so in our work, we do focus on invariant features um, that can transfer to a specific task, specific target task. But in general, if you want um, some features that are going to be able to protect you against a large um, class of distribution shifts, then you probably want, and you don't have latent variables, then you probably want um, to take the parents. So you want causal. Um, variables because similarly to the case I had before. So if your shift is, for example, let's say your, your domain is like your, your data set is, you have data sets from the US and uh, you use, based on the data sets from the US, maybe from some culinary school and from some normal population, you find that tips per month is invariant, but it's not going to be, it's not, you're not sure if it's causal or not, and you think maybe it doesn't matter, but then you try to use this model and you transfer it in a different country then it does matter because in a different country, you don't know yet if maybe the mechanism of how tips are assigned is different or not, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, so I have another question. Would you show one more time flow of causation versus association slide with X1 and X2 causal graphs? Um, so there isn't, um, maybe I, I kind of, I didn't explain it very well, but so this is a causal graph. So we assume this graph is known in X1 and X2. So there is X1 causing Y and Y causing X2. So this is a very specific uh, situation. So it, this is the case in which you do know this causal graph. So there is no association here. The association is, it comes from the disseparation. So the association or correlation comes from the, how we, we can read about these separations. And so that's kind of, Maybe it's easier to check at the demo I showed before, and I can also send you a link afterwards if that helps. So maybe in the interest of time, I'll kind of go a bit further. So after now, we were discussing about how this separation can help if we do know the causal graph. Um, but what happens if we don't know the causal graph? And what happens if we have latent confounders? And maybe, let's say, we also want to kind of have something that disentangles the difference between the different source domains and also disentangles what is the difference in the in a new target domain. And uh, so like 
And uh, maybe you want to also avoid some kind of the assumptions that I mentioned before that there are some of the common pitfalls, assuming that what is invariant across the different source domains will stay invariant in the target domain. And so this is essentially some of the desiderata that we, are, we were considering. And that's why we essentially started to work on this algorithm that we call, like, on this problem that we call causal domain adaptation problem, which essentially it's um, an unsupervised multi-source domain adaptation problem. And we did interpret the change in the target domain as a soft intervention. Um, and so we had some assumptions and the most important assumption is that the label cannot be intervened upon directly in the target domain. So the label, the distribution of Y can still change, but it, it has to change mediated through some of the features. Otherwise we are not able to um, reconstruct the label. Okay, so, and to do this, we used another framework that we developed that we call joint causal inference. And it's kind of a, it's kind of a, let's say, um, a principled approach on represent, so for how to represent jointly different distributions with a single causal graph. And the idea is that, actually the, the basic idea is very simple. We actually spend more, more time explaining uh, why it works than actually developing the idea. The idea was very simple, it was to add Instead of adding one context variable, one domain variable D, we added several context variables because we wanted to be able to distinguish the changes across the different source domains, across the different data sets. So for example, um, if we have like, as I said before, we have some normal mice with feature X1 and X2 and Y, and then we have some genetically modified mice which feature like with, um, with a gene that was in kind of knocked out was let's say gene A. And we had another batch of genetically modified mice when the gene that was knocked out was B. We wanted to put them together and we'd have like two context variables, C1 and C2. And C1 would represent, uh, essentially it's an indicator variable that it's one when gene A, like when the, there are mice from the batch gene A. And C2 is one when there are match, uh, mice from the batch the, from uh, when gene B was intervened. Essentially it's just a way to uh, instead of having one domain variable to have several of them so we can condition on them at different times and we're able to disentangle graphically uh, where do things change in the different uh, domains. And so the idea is that you can also use this method even if the graphs are different in the different source domains. So if in one of the source domains you have x1 causing y but y doesn't cause x2, then this is, um, you can have this graph and then you have another graph in which you have x1 causing y and y causing x2 in another domain. If you put them together, you get a joint graph that's the one on the right. If you have, like, essentially, it's the union of the two graphs. So y does cause x2, but there is a context variable c1 that shows the change in the function of x2, because x2 changes in a different context. So uh, the idea there was essentially that we wanted to learn an equivalence class of this single causal graph and we wanted to use conditional independence tests on systematically pooled data. So we wanted to essentially just treat these context variables that we invented as normal variables. And then we just wanted to use um, essentially normal methods for discovering causal graphs or equivalence uh, classes of graphs. And so the idea is why did we discuss, why are we discussing about this? We're discussing about this because I'm interested in the case in which we have this, we want to find separating features, so features that transfer, but the causal graph is unknown. And so the idea is, uh, for example, if the causal graph is unknown, but if we had some data, some labels in the target domain, then I could test the conditional independences in the data. So I would test if the distribution of Y given X1 changes across uh, the different source domains and the target domain. So that's one thing I would try to do. But the problem is that in our unsupervised domain adaptation case, we don't have any label in the target domain. And so we're not able to test these conditional dependencies. And so you can see. So, um, and then the idea is that instead, because we're not able to test these conditional dependencies, we're able to test a lot of other conditional dependencies. So the idea is to use those as constraints over possible causal graphs and see even if in all of the causal graphs that we do find, so the ones that fit the constraints, if a certain condition dependence holds or not. So, okay, so before I go into assumptions, let me check 
the question. When expanding the data set with context variables, should you train with the expanded data set? Um, so we don't need to train because these are like thick variables that we do add. So you can, um, so we can just add them. And they're like, in, in a lot of cases, they're literally just indicator variables. It's just a way, essentially, a trick for us to keep separated the different distributions, um, but still having like a graph representation of them as if they were a single one. If that, I hope that answers your question. So, let's see. So some of the assumptions we had in this 2018 paper were that there was an acyclic causal graph that feeds the data, uh, which is something we have since expanded in the joint causal inference paper. So we, we had an expansion to cyclic graphs. And also we assume, as I said before, that um, the label cannot change directly in the target domain. It has to change only through uh, mediated, the change has to be mediated through some of the features. And so then we had some kind of some technical assumptions that I think maybe are not super interesting. Uh, but you know, if you want to discuss it later in questions, we can discuss it. And so we have an example that can be solved by hand because you know um, this may look a bit like magic because I'm saying uh, we do some conditional independence tests, and I will tell you about the conditional independence tests that you really care, but you cannot test in the data because part of the data is missing. And so uh, we have an example in the paper that we worked out um, by hand essentially, in which we show that if there are these three conditional independences that I'm showing here in the middle, um, they are like only there are only a certain number of possible causal graphs that fit these conditional independences. So there are, there are more than one because that is generally the case with causal discovery. So there are multiple graphs that could fit the data. Um, but in all of them, and so this is like on the representation on the right, in all of them, some of the edges are the same. So the edges which are uh, black, they are the same, but the ones which are dotted, they may or may not appear in some of the graphs. So we're not sure about those edges given the data, but we're very sure about the ones which are solid. And so in all of the solid ones, we can see that you know y is going to be disseparated from c1, which is the variable that in this case represents the essentially the question marks. So when c1 is one, is the target set, so it's the question marks. So y is disseparated from c1 um, when we condition on x1, because there is essentially a path from uh, y through x2 to c1. This path is closed because x2 is a collider, so it's usually closed if we don't condition it. So if you don't touch it, it's fine. There is a path from y through x1 to c1 that it's closed when we condition on x1. There is another path from y through x1 to c2 to c1 again. And this one is again closed when I condition on x1. So even if I'm not sure exactly which is the correct graph of the data, because I there is some data missing. And in general, in causality, we often don't know exactly which is the correct causal graph. We have multiple solutions. Uh, even if I'm not sure exactly which one is the correct one, I can tell you which is a separating set. In this case, X1 is a separating set. And so this is a very small example uh, because we did it by hand, but essentially in our work, we try to operation, uh, operationalize it with a theorem prover so that we don't need to do it by hand. We just have a theorem prover proof for us uh, which of the sets are we can prove are separating, which we can prove are not separating and which we're unsure about. And so this is essentially our algorithm. So let's say we have a query. Uh, we want to know if X1 is a separating set. So if X1 is a feature that will allow us um, to transfer the prediction from the source domains to the target domains for Y. We have the assumptions that are a bit technical that I explained before, but um, uh, if you're interested, we, either I will point you to the paper or we can discuss it a bit later. We have a lot of conditional dependencies that we can test from the data. As I said, we don't know what is a causal graph and honestly, we don't care because we just want to prove a specific disseparation or conditional independence. And we do have a logic encoding of disseparation from somebody else. So from Hittin and et al, 2014, we send it to a theorem prover and the theorem prover can give us three kinds of answers. And one is sure, you know, X1 is a provably separating set um, or no, X1 is never a separating set. Or they could say it's not identifiable, which means that there are multiple possible causal graphs. And in some, X1 is a separating set, and some X1 is not a separating set. And we're not sure which one is the true causal graph, as often is the case in causality. And so this is essentially a bit like magic. Um, I, I was telling you, because we have missing data, and because in general, 
in causality, multiple graphs feed the data. Um, we're not sure exactly what's happening, but still I can tell you which of the features is a good feature and which is not a good feature, depending on some assumptions, obviously. And so given this kind of separating sets that we found, essentially we use it in an algorithm we call causal feature selection. And the idea was it was just essentially a proof of concept. So it was used like random forests and we ordered like subsets of features and context variables, for example, X1, C2, and C2, X1, X2, and C2. So we had also the context variables in there as features. And we did order them by the ones which had the lowest error on the source domains. And based on that, then we query from the ones which, you know, uh, essentially a brute force approach almost, we query the theorem prover from the subsets of features to find some which were probably separating. So we know that we can guarantee that the error will be bound. And so on those, like on the first probably separating set that we find, so the one with the lowest source domain of the ones which we can prove that they're separating, on that set A, we then train a model in the source domains F of A to predict Y. And then we can apply F of A in the target domain to predict Y because we do know that um, essentially these features are not biased. So let me check for a question. Uh, so this is like, um, this work was very much based on more like random forest. So we didn't consider features in that sense. So we didn't consider features in like deep neural networks. Uh, I think um, we haven't looked into it, but I think maybe you could see them as their representations. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, this is a question from the audience. Um, for us, we were, I think, a lot of causality work is still a bit uh, in the more uh, handcrafted features stage. Also, I will, as we'll explain a bit later, we do have some issues with scalability. So I think that probably won't work with neural networks, at least from the scalability point of view. Um, let's see. So we did have some results and essentially the idea was we simulated some data and then we use random forest for feature selection and regression. And our method essentially had the lower loss in the transfer. So this is one of the ideas. And we also tried it on some real world data and then our results are a bit um, less good. So we tried to do something a bit different in which we tried to do something called, we call it cause across validation. So we selected three phenotypes and two knockouts and we generated 1000 data sets. And for each data set we randomly choose, we pretended that we didn't know some of the, some of the features. So we choose which Y was and we pretended that we didn't know it so that we could reconstruct it. And so this is how we essentially created these graphs. And in the end, so um, as you can imagine, the desiderat I gave in the beginning are kind of biased, but what, what we did. So some of the things that we, we managed to do, which I think are interesting, are we managed to do a domain adaptation method in which we don't necessarily know the causal graph and we allow for latent confounders. And this is something that we managed to do because we use joint causal inference. So some approach that we developed. And then um, we also try to avoid the other pitfalls. And importantly, we never really cared about finding the graph because um, actually in a bit of a weird answer to the person that was asking before, in this case, we didn't care about finding the graph. We didn't care about finding causal parents. We care only about finding things that are invariant, but they're invariant in a very specific way. And we also check, so instead of using things that are only invariant in the data set, in the source data sets, we also use the parts that we could, the unlabeled parts of the target domain to check which of the things still didn't change, which of the features, their distribution still didn't change. And so there are some other methods that have, uh, that you know, my colleagues have worked on, so I wanted to give them a shout out. So this is on uh, using essentially causal discovery for bandits and how to use this concept of separating sets. And I think this is a very good paper. And again, here you don't care about finding the true causal graph which is generally um, requires a lot of interventional data. You don't even care about finding the equivalence class, which is also kind of complicated if you have some missing data. What you care about is the separating sets, and that's what you're going to use to improve your bandits. And so uh, maybe to give you an idea of the limitations, so uh, we did have some, so this work is, uh, I really like my work, obviously. So it, I think it's very interesting, but it also has a lot of limitations. So I think that's important to mention. So one of the limitations is that uh, we wanted to find only sets that we can prove are separating so that we can prove are going to have like a bounded 
generalization error. And depending on how many source domains you have, uh, you may not be able to prove that. And so one of the questions I'm, I'm interested in is how can we use, for example, um, experiment design or active learning or intervention design to decide some interventions that you can do in order to find the separating sets. And so this is a bit similar to what um, now it's work on causal bandit does. Another thing that I'm very interested in is um, how to improve the scalability. So these methods at the moment, they work on tens, fifteens of variables. So that's not really, as we discussed before, uh, deep, uh, deep learning kind of scale. So one of the questions is how to essentially improve uh, this, this kind of logic-based encodings that we use. So the logic of this operation, how can we improve it maybe in an approximate way to make it more scalable. And finally, some of the um, ideas I was interested in is how to apply this to multitask reinforcement learning, especially, for example, if you have an MDP in which you have a graph representing the state, for example, factor MDPs. So thank you. So let me check the next question. OK, so there is a final question, I think. Maybe then we start the discussion. But one of the questions was, um, it is not clear to me how the identified causal features are finally exploited for domain adaptation. Um, could you elaborate a bit? OK, yes. So we don't, um, in this work, we don't find the causal features. So this is not about finding causal features, but about finding features that are probably separating uh, when C1 represents the target domain. So we want to find features for which we, we can prove that their distribution condition, like, so the distribution of the label Y conditioning on these features is going to stay stable from the source domains to the target domain so that we can bound the generalization error, which, which is otherwise unbounded. So that's what we're looking for. Does it make sense? Uh, if you want, we can have a discussion or... Uh, let me try this. I was sure, yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yep. Right. Hi. Yeah. Hi. Um, so uh, would you then retrain your model uh, on the features that transfer well to the new domain? So uh, no, so I, I wouldn't retrain it because I would first try to identify them. And once I have them, I would essentially use them. It's essentially like a feature selection, uh, like a, if you want to cause a, we call it causal feature selection, but that's a misnomer. Let's say a separating feature selection method. So instead of using all of the features, um, you want to train, let's say, a neural network. You give me a set of features that you want to train a neural network with. Um, and I, I tell you, yeah, don't use, you can use this one and this one. Don't use this one because it's going to bias your data or your model, if it makes sense. Right. Okay, sounds good. Um, if you want, we can discuss more. Okay. Otherwise, I'm, you know, happy to have more discussions. Yeah, thank you for the great talk. Yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, yeah, I think we still have questions. So, Vihari, if you have other questions, we can still discuss it. Uh, uh, I, I do, uh, but uh, yeah. I would let other, th there are some other questions that we can answer. That I think we still have time, we can. Uh, can uh, there is a question tapped. Okay, yeah. So there's a question from Thomas Dietrich. Dietrich. Uh, is there a way to apply causal adjustment in this method? Um, so we don't really apply causal adjustment. For now, we're just trying to find uh, essentially this, this separation that we cannot prove. I think I actually was thinking about that. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I need to read up on causal adjustment. But in, in a sense, maybe that's a different type of question because we don't try to find the graph. If we did have an equivalent class of graphs, then there are methods, for example, from uh, Marlis Mathaus, uh, Emma Parkwich, and others, which do find um, adjustment sets for um, if you do have an equivalence class. But in our case, it's a bit of a weird equivalence class because some data are missing, some conditional dependencies are missing. Does it make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay I wasn't sure if it made sense. Okay. You, okay, so it's another question. Could you briefly tell us what the what assumptions are needed to find probably not separating sets? Okay. Um, so, um, let's see. Okay. So some of the assumptions, so these are like the assumptions that we do have. So in this method, 
which is a bit old. We did use like an assumption that the graph, so we can have multiple graphs in the different da um, data sets essentially in different domains. And when we put them together, we assume that the union is still a cyclic, which may not be the case because if in one data set you have X causing Y and the other set, data set you have Y causing X, when you put them together, you have a cycle. So this is one of the assumptions that we used. Um, the, this is like the most important assumption is this one that the, essentially the, but the label that you're trying to predict cannot be intervened upon directly. So it cannot change in the target domain because otherwise there, there wouldn't be at all ever any separating set. So this is one of the things that we are used. And some other assumptions that we did use. So we had a way to say that essentially, assuming the target domain, there are no new conditional independencies. Uh, that involve y. So this is, um, it's a bit kind of tricky, but essentially these were some of the assumptions. But even with these assumptions, we're not sure yet before running the specific instance if something is probably separating or not. So that's something that the theorem proven and can only tell us and it changes uh, based on the different condition, essentially the results of the conditional dependence tests. So we haven't looked into that specifically to characterize it. Maybe that's an interesting direction. So I think, I hope this maybe answers the question. So we haven't looked at it in a sense. Okay. Hi. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just had another one really quick. Yeah. So what kind of independence tests have you used? Oh, okay. So. I think we used the, the, because it was a proof of concept, we used like uh, essentially just uh, linear regression, so correlation, uh, not independence and partial right. uh, partial correlation. So we use it like, uh, also when we simulate the data, especially um, often in causality, when we simulate the data for constraint-based methods, so methods that use conditional independences, we often simulate linear Gaussian, method, linear Gaussian data. So this actually is one of the, things that we should probably improve as a community. Yeah, yeah thanks. And how do you deal with, um, if you have multiple independence tests, do you correct for it? Yeah, so we do. So the, the method that we use from uh, anti heating and, and, and others. So in that method, um, you can do essentially redundant conditional independence tests. And then um, some of our work, we have essentially formulated the way to use, in this case, uh, p-values as a kind of weight. So essentially, it, it looks like a weighted constraint optimization problem, like, almost like a weighted maxat kind of problem, if that makes sense to you. Or essentially, we have weights on the conditional dependencies. So they can sometimes, uh, if the weight is very low and there are a lot of conditional dependencies that disagree with this specific one, they can be somehow um, violated, in a sense, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. thank you. We, we also have one raised hand. Oh, sorry. Can oh, I ask a yeah. question? Sure. Hi, thank you, uh, Sara, for the a very nice presentation. Uh, I believe one of the main uh, problem with the scalability is the yeah. uh, nature of the algorithm that you proposed in uh, yeah, the NIPS paper brute force search. Yeah. So uh, uh, inspired by your great work, uh, me and my colleagues, Puyan Jamshidi and Umpandi, we uh, developed a, a new algorithm. I, I will share the link on the mm -hmm. chat that uh, how can we take advantage of the, uh, instead of this uh, brute force search, mm -hmm. uh, restrict ourselves to the uh, Markov blanket of the target variable. And I proved yeah. it theoretic theoretically that searching in the Markov blanket is enough to find the separating set for the acyclic directed mixed graph. And uh, we got the very nice results, uh, uh, even for the data set, for uh, cancer data set with 400,000 mm -hmm. features. Um, uh, the algorithm works very well. Uh, I, if you're interested, you can. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Out. I will check it out. I think that's, I, I agree. That's one of the problems of both 
this method, but in general, actually also um, constraint-based causal discovery. So if you do manage to focus on the Markov bracket and you have some sparsity assumptions, I, I can believe that that makes sense and that you would be able to scale much better. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. We, okay, nice. I will check it. Yeah, uh, maybe let's do one more question before we move on to the training question. Yeah. So I think there is a question in the QA. Um, so there, Emily is asking if, um, regarding the assumption of no extra dependencies involving Y, how to deal with latent unsober confounders. Um, yeah, so you can, so yeah. So I think maybe the example I gave was, uh, I think, um, maybe I stopped sharing the screen, right? Okay. I oh, know I did. Yeah, I did not. Okay, it's here. Um, okay, so in the example I gave, I think none of the methods that I, I would need to check with Muhammad, but I, none of the methods that I know of uh, are able to do anything if there are like uh, essentially changes on Y, for example, even confounders on Y. So in that case, it wouldn't work, but they can be confounders in other parts of the graph. So you can have confounders between X1 and X2, et cetera. Uh, but in that case, um, I think. In general, in that case, it's it's not very it's not very clear how to use causal discovery methods or causality inspired methods to do the transfer. Do you maybe want to follow up? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, if you have any other question, you can ask as well. Okay, that's good. Okay. Yes. Thank. Thank you for the great presentation again. So. Uh, Maybe let's save a couple more minutes for the journey questions. Okay, and uh, here is our signature question. Okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, can you talk about your journey a little bit? Like what motivated you to work on the topic today? And uh, what motivates you to become a professor as well as a research scientist? Okay, so thank you for the question. Uh, it's, it's actually, I think, find a very difficult question uh, to summarize, you know, a person's life in uh, like uh, a short thing. So for me, I mean, uh, I, as a kid, I always wanted to know what, you know, I was very curious and annoying kid. I always wanted to know why, what, what causes what, um, why things happen. And so initially I wanted to be actually a quantum physicist. I think I was a bit biased because I came from a city in Italy when there is a theoretical physics center. So I kind of was very interested in that. Uh, but then I decided that maybe um, engineering was a better idea because I also started to become more interested in programming and you know trying to build things. And so I think um, I was actually doing database research during my master's. And then essentially I, I came to Amazon and started in, essentially from serendipity, I started working with Yoris Moy who works on causality. And that's why I started working on causality. So that happened in the middle of my PhD. So I don't really, I don't recommend that to change topic during your PhD. You should think about it a bit more better maybe if you can, uh, because it is very you know, stressful. But in the end, it was also very rewarding because I found a topic that I really like. And uh, so it's a very, um, generally very kind of also philosophically deep topic. And it's, um, you know, I've been working on it um, during my PhD. Then I went to MIT IBM, and essentially, I think um, I think it was a very nice place to do like kind of very theoretical research in industry. But let's say my concern was that I also wanted to be able to teach students or mentor students for a bit longer, and also be able to have like a continuity in my possibly very theoretical um, ideas. And I was kind of worried that in general in industry, that does tend to happen that, you know, there are some times in which you have some uh, space to do very theoretical things, but very often you have to go back to do more applied things. So I wanted to be in, as a professor in, in academia, because I wanted to be able to have essentially the academic freedom to do things, uh, even theoretical things. Yeah, and uh, thank you for uh, continuing to be the mentor to the younger generation. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. Uh, maybe another question. Uh, so, uh, what's your thoughts on trustworthy machine learning and its future? So, uh, what do you think the landscape might look like in five years? Oh, that's a 
it's very difficult to say because then you say something and it's you know wrong. <laughs> uh, but I do think like the at least from my perspective, um, um, I do believe strongly that the robustness uh, in machine learning has to be kind of uh, dealt with. And I'm, I'm also like, uh, like, I think that's kind of something that all of machine learning should be doing, like essentially have robust methods. Um, and I do also care about, you know, fairness and explainability, but I do think in robustness is something that goes beyond the specific applications. So I think that's something we need to have figure out. That's, that's great. Yeah, that's also something I believe. Great. Okay. And, and great I think, yeah. And I think causality is like the foundation of all of this, but I'm very biased, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm very excited to hear that from uh, other people. Great, cool. Okay, uh, so uh, now it might be the time uh, for our seminar. So uh, according to our uh, planned agenda, so uh, now we plan to have a five minute break and then we can come back with a more live discussion more interactive and also uh, uh sarah uh, you are not obliged to stay with us but uh, we will welcome you and and uh, i think the discussion could be very interesting and yeah in any case just want to thank you again for the wonderful talk today